I'm really excited to be here today. I'm going to talk about the digital reality that already exists. We think that a lot of the stuff will happen in the future, but it's already happening now. We are already being attacked. Basically, if you're a business, the thief is already there, ready to grab the plants that you are growing. Some businesses might say, hey, my plant is still growing. It's not attacked yet. Yeah, but it's going to be grabbed very, very soon. That's the core of my uh, talk that I'm giving. Reality is happening now. Change is happening now, look around you, act now, don't wait. Och nu är jag jättespänd på att få höra Dietmar Darmen från dem som kommer att komma ut. Please join us me on the scene. And um, we're all looking forward to a very exciting um, speech. Thank hey, you very much. Hi, hi, hi. Boom, boom, boom. I'm from another country. I'm from Austria. So Austria is basically like out of space. And I flew in here, so I flew out of space. And when you fly out of space, you notice that our solar system, what you learn our solar system is like, what you learn it in school, our solar system is not like this. It's not like there's the sun in the center and all the planets really perfectly curve around it. And your business system is also not like this. It's not that your headquarters are in the center and your customers and your outlets and everything perfectly circles around it and it's wonderful. Nothing in reality works like clockwork. Nothing moves in cycles. In reality, everything moves on. And we are blasting through space at 72,000 kilometers an hour towards the nearest planet. And in reality, the sun is in the center, blasting through space like crazy. And the planets are going trying to catch up, right? Everything is moving. And everything is moving if you like it or not. Everything is changing if you like it or not. And a friend of mine lives on the planet. And all of a sudden, that planet was changing us well. And the planet he lived on was Krypton. There it is. So you know it's Superman. And one day, as you might know, the planet Krypton exploded. Boom. It was gone. His business was gone. His clients were gone. His infrastructure was gone. Everything was gone. And he said, oh my God, change, horrible. But then he jumped in a capsule and he actually flew to a new planet and he said, let's Forget about the danger, let's go somewhere new. And then he landed on planet Earth, and it was the future for him. On planet Earth, all of a sudden, was really, really good. The planet Krypton exploded, but he said goodbye Krypton, and then hello Earth. And on Earth, all of a sudden, he noticed, oh my God, I have super strength, I'm invulnerable. So the change made him strong. The change gave him power. On Krypton, Superman is a totally regular guy. If you go to Superman on Krypton and say, hey, lift this house, he says, what, how can I do that? You throw this train somewhere, fly around, look through walls. He said, I can't do that. I'm a regular guy. But on planet Earth in the new environment, he could do it. So the problem was not the new. The problem was not the new environment. He actually loved the new. We all love the new. We say, hey, new phone, how awesome is that? You know? And we love the powers, and he can run faster than a train. And he goes, oh, look, look how fast I can run. It's awesome. It's wonderful. And then, uh, as I said, he loves the new phone. And now he has a smartphone. And Superman with a smartphone is saving people, taking selfies all the time, and looking really, really happy. And we love everything from our smartphones. And and we love it and we can't resist it. Everything is awesome. So we love the new, we like the new, but we don't like to give up the old. And if you're a Superman and you're used to changing in a phone booth, that's getting really difficult <laughs> because there's no more phone booths. But you love the old, you say, that's where I change and that's the problem. The old stuff drains the power Kryptonite, which is from the planet Krypton, if you bring that close to Superman, that makes him weak. The old stuff drains the power. Kryptonite drains power. Analog drains power. If your business is digital and all of a sudden you have a fax or a folder or a binder or a handwritten thing that's analog, it drains power. It makes you weak. It makes everything collapse and melt. It's not good, right? Old actions drain power. Old thinking drains power. Old technology brings power. So what change really means is not just the new. What change really, really means is that you need to leave the old behind. You have to say goodbye to the old. But that's not very easy. Let's say you're Superman and you're on the planet Earth, and at first you're a Clark Kent. 
Clark Kent to the reporter, there's Clark Kent behind me, and the reporter Clark Kent, he has certain things, certain technologies that he loves and understands, like his shoes. And they're actually very expensive shoes. If you know shoes, those are John Love shoes. Those are 6,000 pound shoes, handmade, custom-made shoes. And he goes, well, it's Clark Kent, those shoes are really good, but as Superman, I need new shoes, I need red shoes. But then his finance guy goes, oh my God, are you wet? You can't change the shoes, they were so expensive. We invested so much money in those machines and this technology. You have to wait till it's written off. You can't wait, we need to text the debt the shoes. We can't do that, you can't do that. And then it's a huge investment, you need to text the debt wait five years. Be Superman with the John Love shoes and then you can change. And it's not only investments, right? It's sometimes technology that we love and understand, like he might love his tie. And he can do the tie, he understands the technology. You wake him up 3 a.m. in the morning, da 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 doof, done, you know? Fill out the form, clack, 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 done. Send it out, order mail, blah, 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 done a thousand times, he loves it. And the tie is not only a technology that he loves, the tie is a technology that other people love as well. Because the tie, for instance, is from his girlfriend, from Lois Lane. So he goes to Lois Lane and he says, Lois, you know what? I'm gonna get rid of the tie. Because when I'm Superman, the old technology might be dangerous. The evil people might take me by the tie and go, boom, and kill me. But what does Lois say? Lois says, no way, don't you love me? You can't close down my division. <laughs> you know, analog is still good. It's wonderful, it's wonderful. Please, if you love me, don't fire me. And he says, I love you, but I need to get rid of the tie and everything, tons of things. Everybody says, no, 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 no way, don't change. Don't become Superman at all. Stay Clark Kent, we need you. You're so funny in the office. And you can bring coffee and take photos. It's awesome, please stay. But he says, against the wall, there's this wall of no way, no way, no way. And that wall is there. That is a huge wall and it's made from stone. It's a really, really tough wall. But he says, if I want to go become Superman, you, I have to go through this. So only you as a person, as a Superman or a Superwoman, only you can say, I'll do it. And only you can actually break through that wall and make the wall possible. And breaking through is not easy because everybody's stonewalling. Everybody in your business, your clients, everybody in the world is stonewalling all the time. Look at Tesla. When Tesla, when Elon Musk decided to invest into Tesla a couple of years ago, everybody says, what? <coughs> An electric car? No way. No way, man. There is totally no need for an electric vehicle outside the golf course. Look at what a real car sounds like. Boom, bam, bam, bam. That's a car. Electric vehicle. Who needs that, you know? There's totally no need for a car like that. And actually, look when a car, an electric car drives, there's no reach. You can drive like, I don't know, 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers, that's it. And if it's empty, it's empty. There's no network to charge it. So what did Elon Musk do? He says, okay, no need, no reach, no network, I do it. And he did it, and he made the car relatively sexy and everybody wanted to have it, and he made it so big that you can put batteries like crazy in the car, and then he created the network first in the US and then in Europe, and bam, 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 he went through the wall three times. When printing press was invented by Gutenberg, 93% of the people could not read. The market was really, really, really slow, a small. And if you could read, you could never buy a book because there were no bookstores. And if you actually could read and there was a bookstore and that likelihood is really slow, uh, small, uh, but if you were over 50, you couldn't see what's printed because there were no reading glasses. <laughs> so there's no bookstores, nobody can read, no reading glasses and Gutenberg says, hey, you know what, I'll do it. And bam, 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 he went through the walls, right? Uh, Edison, when he invented the light bulb, there were no power plants, there were no power lines, and you couldn't switch the thing on. 
because there were no power switches. And bam, 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 he did it, right? Driving was illegal. It's not only that the people say there's no need, we don't need that. He says, you must not do that. I forbid you to do that. Driving was illegal. Autonomous driving was illegal. You must not drive. Drones were illegal. You must not use drones. And bam, 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 technology and service and future went through the walls and this never stops. It never stops to win against one and the another, next one arrives. It's not that you or Superman fights the evil person and then he says, well, pff, what could ever happen now? I fought the guy. The website is done. We have an app. We never have to do anything ever again. We can relax. That won't happen, right? Because the fight continues and the fight is not funny. The fight is actually deadly. There should be sounds. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Either you die or I do. That's what the guy said, right? There's explosions, you know, people want to destroy your business, destroy your city. So what is next for us, right? Is robots the next person that's going to attack us? Robots are already there. It's not the next thing. It's already there. This is the robot from the children's hospital in Basel, and this robot actually goes to class instead of you if you're a kid and you're in the hospital for a longer period of time. Because normally when you were in the hospital, in the class, you became invisible. You became what's called a shadow child. You didn't exist. But no, the robot goes to class instead of you, and everybody says, hey, wow, you're the coolest kid ever. You know, you have a robot replacing you. So that exists already. If you're in Tokyo, Japan, that's Pepper, and Pepper is a sales agent in Tokyo, Japan, all the time. If you want to become a street artist, don't worry about it anymore. The robots are much better. You know, robots can draw you faster and nicer and much more fun, right? So the thing is that Robots is not the future, robots is already here. What about artificial intelligence? Is artificial intelligence coming? Yeah, because very soon you can say, hey Siri, book me a flight to D Congress in Gothenburg, and then it will happen, right? Basically, Google uses artificial intelligence, Facebook uses artificial intelligence, Amazon, Baidu, everybody does that. That's the gene P53, and the gene P53 is very important for a bunch of sicknesses, and it's been identified 30 years ago. And for 30 years, the development was rather slow and then they put artificial intelligence on it and it completely changed. For 30 years there was an average of one discovery a year and then they put Watson on it, artificial intelligence, and now you have six discoveries in a couple of weeks. That's a humongous change. So basically research can be done by artificial intelligence. Sharing. What if the people don't want to own the products you wanted to sell them anymore? What if they just want to have access? Is it coming? It's already there. Those are the hotels in San Francisco, and those are the Airbnbs in San Francisco. And also in Paris, there are more Airbnb rooms to offer than hotel rooms. So the scale has already tipped. Sharing is already bigger than the other uh, traditional forms of stuff. What about machine-to-machine -machine communication? If you're in retail, maybe you already have robots that go through the aisles and scan the shelves and see if the products are put in the right placement or if you need to reorder stuff, and they do it automatically. And if you're really, really cool, you already have a robot that cuts fruits and stuff like that, and everybody goes, hey, let's go to the cool restaurant that's our uh, cool supermarket that's much funner and have the fruit cut by a robot. Machine to machine is also there on a very, very big scale. Hamburg Harbor, for instance, needed to grow and they couldn't grow physically, so they employed machine-to-machine -machine communication. And every object talks with every other object. So the ship says, hey, train, I need you in 35 minutes, get ready. And the train says, boom, done, I'll be there. And then the ship says, hey, bridge, I need you to open in 12 minutes. And the bridge says, hey, slow down, I need 15 minutes. And everybody talks with everybody, and that happened, the result was that Hamburg Harbor grew three times three times in volume, in profit, in everything, without geographically growing a single square centimeter. That's all because of machine-to-machine -machine communication. It absolutely optimizes the business. What about virtual reality? 
I don't know if you love virtual reality. We talked about virtual realities for years, but then came January 6th and bam, 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 you could order Oculus, yay, and everybody was happy. And if you were at CES in Vegas, yay, there was a huge line and everybody loved it. And then I loved it and we all used it. And this was not uh, only the Oculus Rift, that's the um, Morpheus from Sony and that's the um, Samsung thing, I drove actually two days ago in Switzerland again through a moonscape, it was really, really awesome. Those things exist. And with the gear, with the Samsung gear and other opportunities, virtual reality becomes very easy because your phone becomes a virtual reality monitor. And there's actually already media using that. The New York Times launched an Apple Card powered virtual reality app where they present certain um, stories. The first story they presented were on the refugee crisis and you could actually go through in three total 3D in reality, you could go through the camps and look at the misery of the people. And if you could look at the misery of life, you can also look at the luxury of life. And you can actually say, hey, look at this car, it's awesome. Or look at this uh, hotel room, it's awesome. If you think about static things like rooms and stuff like that, what I would call the experience prediction model, where you basically say, will I like the room? Is that interesting to me? Should I invest in this certain thing? I don't know, there's a bunch of young people there, but when I was a student and I picked a room, my experience prediction model was this. So I saw that in the newspaper, and then I said, oh, nice. <laughs> Let's move there. <laughs> And now you actually have it a little bit better because you have 2D, but very soon it will be 3D, right? You can actually walk through the room, and if you live here, you can walk through your room on the Bahamas and say, yes, let's buy this room right now, right? So and the reason why this happens is because it's very, very easy. All you need is the stick. You can either do the GoPro thing, or you can do the Samsung thing, or whatever it is, it's done very, very easily. And you can basically show the people what the experience will be like in the virtual reality. It's awesome. What about 3D printing? 3D printing has been there forever. Everybody has him or herself in a small 3D printed thing. Food has been 3D printed. Cars have been 3D printed. This car is 6,000 euros. And the car needs to drive maybe on a bridge. You can 3D print the bridge. This bridge is 3D printed actually from the computer. So there's the only thing you need to do on a CAD program, you design the bridge. You push a button and the robots go do 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 print it. And you might know that Adidas wants to have a 3D printer for customized shoes in every store by the end of the year or maybe uh, the middle of next year. Those things are happening already. They are not coming, they are there. They are the expectations of your customer. And what about data? Data drives all those things because it's all about the exchange of data. And the data, if you look at data today, data is everywhere. Data is everywhere. You all have data on you because you have a mobile phone on you. And we can all track you and know you where you are. And data is virtually everywhere. And if something is everywhere, we can call it an atmosphere. An atmosphere is everywhere. There's the at this room is full of atmosphere. We don't see it. We don't smell it. We can't touch it. We're not aware of it. But if I were to suck the atmosphere out, you would all die. And that would be really sad. <laughs> so even though you're not aware of it, you need it. And the atmosphere that you are breathing today wasn't there on the planet all the time. The atmosphere that you are breathing today was created, as you might remember. Earth's original atmosphere was rich in methane, ammonia, water vapor, and the noble gas neon, but it lacked free oxygen, no oxygen. Early life made the oxygen. Those guys made our oxygen. Those guys made our oxygen. And the oxygen that was all of a sudden everywhere powered all new life forms. All those things that you see there basically are based on oxygen. And the oxygen also killed all the old life. All the old life rusted. It's called the oxidization of life. There used to be certain life forms like this one. It doesn't exist anymore. It's dead. It's rusted. It doesn't exist anymore. And now, 
Now we have a new atmosphere, and the new atmosphere is also created, and the new atmosphere obviously is not chemical, but the new atmosphere is data. And data gives power to all new life forms. All new life things basically work with data. And data also kills all old life. All the old things are dying because they can't cope with data. When breathable oxygen was introduced to the planet, life exploded. It's called the Cambrian explosion. There used to be a bunch of life forms, and then all of a sudden we had a shared atmosphere, and then there were insects, plants, dinosaurs, rabbits, all kinds of things. Right? Boof, life exploded, boom. And because of breathable data, business is exploding. There used to be only big companies that can do big investments, and now there's startups and startups, and they come up with everything. Business used to be either housing or cars or clothing or whatever, and now, boom, everything. Success exploded. Look at all those things. There's all stuff that are exploding, billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars, all because of breathable data. All those companies breathe data. Knowledge is exploding. Knowledge is exploding like crazy. The knowledge doubling curve, the curve where time... The, the, the time, how long it takes that you know twice as much as anybody before, until the year 1900, it was every 100 years. Every 100 years, we knew twice as much as the people 100 years before. 1925, it was every 25 years. And now, or last year actually, in 2015, it was every 13 months. Every 13 months, we knew twice as much because we had data. I don't know when you drive a car, uh, or uh, do you have car sharing? Do you know what drive now and car to go is and stuff like that? How do you find the car? You know where it is, you look on your phone. Oh, that's where I am, that's where the car is, and then you go there. But how do you find parking? I hope there's parking, please. <laughs> I saw parking once there two weeks ago, maybe it's still there. <laughs> you, know, you guess. But if you live in a big city like Moscow, San Francisco, London, and stuff like that, more and more streets actually have sensors and all you know where parking is. So basically, that's the doubling of data. Data is everywhere. The customer data you used to have before the year 2000 was really patchy. You didn't know, is that a man or a woman or what person is that old, young, I have no idea, right? Because you have very rough things, what the person bought, maybe what the person liked. And then came social media data, and the picture got a little bit better. Ah, probably a woman, maybe a, a, a young girl, and stuff like that. And today, you have contextual data, since last year, actually. You have contextual data, and the picture of contextual data is super precise. You know everything. You know where the person is, what the person watched on TV, if the person went jogging or not, how much money they have currently, and when the person went jogging in your Gatorade, that's a really important information. All of a sudden, you have contextual data, and contextual data can help you. And if you look at those things, many of those things that you see there are apps. And apps rule, the red stuff are apps. On mobile phones, the red stuff are the apps, and the gray stuff is the basic, the regular internet. And this changes the internet completely. The internet used to be totally open, and then it became a walled garden, right? And basically the walled garden says, if somebody has the data and it's not you, I will. Somebody will have the data and I will not share that data. Very, very easy for the world, world guard. Obviously, it's GAFA, and GAFA means Google. Google is 90% of the uh, search data. Apple, Apple is 45% of uh, smartphone. Facebook, Facebook is 75% of social media. And Amazon, Amazon is 6% of total online sales. And those people have data. And you couldn't get to the data. They didn't give you the data unless you bought them. And they said, ha, we have the data, we know everything. But now with apps, now with apps, that is changing, because now you can fight those things. If you book something at Expedia, Google doesn't have the data. So Expedia defeats Google, and Hotels.com defeats Google, and Airbnb defeats Google. You don't know where they'd go. And even Austrian Airlines, this an airline that big, defeats Google, because I immediately go to Austrian, and Austrian has my data. Google doesn't have the data. So the data goes to the winner. The data goes to the winner, but it doesn't necessarily... Uh, a, 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 a company is not defined by the data it has. It doesn't necessarily mean anything just that you have the data. A company is not defined by the data it has, but what it does with the data. What do you do with the data? 
What do you actually do with the data? And many companies are just like vampires. And they go, I want data. <laughs> and they suck the data and they say, yeah, I will live if I have more data. But if you're a vampire, you don't live, you're dead. The blood lives, but not you. You're still dead, right? But then you suck data and you love the data and sucking data, you hope that sucking data gives you life, but it just makes you more thirsty and you want more data. And you say more data is good. But in reality, more data is just more chaos. Because everybody knows that if you are registered three times, very often you get three newsletters. And if it's not a newsletter, if you register with expensive things like watches or expensive cars, you get three times the mailing. And that's A, extremely expensive, and B, totally annoying. So sucking data is no good. You have to actually think about what you do with the data. Still, everybody sucks data. 98% of companies collect data. You collect data, we all know it. But then companies have different divisions, and different divisions have different systems, and all of a sudden, those systems cannot cooperate. And all your teeth fall out, kaboom because only 8% can combine the data across system, only 5% can work with the data across system, and only 1%, next to no tooth, can use the data to individualize across channels. Like, for instance, from the smartphone to the store in real time. Only 1% can do that, but if they can, Bomb, it's awesome. If they can, they are the alpha hunting business in the world because they deliver a service that is awesome and they move from company-centered action to customer-centered interaction. It's totally, totally good. We know it all, the writing is on the wall forever. You need the data to optimize the processes and to make everything fluid. The writing is on the wall, fluid rules. Fluid is the most important thing. You need fluid content. Fluid content means, for instance, that you went jogging, and then you said, hey, you just went jogging 5K, there's Gatorade 300 meters away, yeah, jog there, and you get an extra point or something. And then you do it. It's a wonderful information. Fluid content is awesome. Fluid discounts. I was in a mall in the US, and I know it's a marketing gag, but it was really, really funny. I walked by a store 20 times, and then I got 20% discount. That's fluid discounts. If I walk past 25 times, I get 25%. It's awesome, it's funny, it's good. You know? Fluid marketing is there and fluid marketing is contextual marketing. And if you look at marketing, when marketing basically came to existence and marketing stepped off the trees into the real world, the first marketing was really, really rough. It was totally primitive. It was a guy like this and it was mass marketing. And you see all the ads for everybody. We do a poster, who's it for? Everyone. Who should buy your product? Everybody. And we were really happy. And then people said, ha, ah, maybe it's not for everybody. You know what I invent? I invent target groups. It's only for children, not for parents. And they said, awesome, target groups, what a great thinking. And we love target groups and we did everything with target groups and it was awesome. And then somebody said, you know what, target groups are boring. You know what the real target group is? A person, individualize it. Because if you bought a TV, you definitely want to buy another TV. That's why you get TV ads six weeks in a row after you bought one, right? And then they got smarter and they said, maybe they don't want another TV. You know what they want? Maybe they want a TV couch. Even better! And they were happy. And then they basically did individualized marketing and it was awesome. But the newest level of evolution is not individualization. The new levels of evolution is context. Contextual individualization. Because if it's sunny, you might be interested in the fact that the restaurant has a garden. And if it's rainy, you're not interested in the fact that the restaurant has a garden. If it's raining, you're interested in the fact that the restaurant has a roof. And if it's cold, maybe it's interesting that the restaurant has a fireplace or something like that. The context changes what you actually need. And that's why there's many, many contextual offers. If you look at the insurance industry, for instance, and I know that you own an apartment, a holiday apartment in the mountains, for instance, and I know that there's a storm coming, I can send an individual message, contextualize because the storm is coming to you, and offer storm insurance for one week. And all you need to do is push. And that is totally, totally good. And Gardner says that by 2017, next year's, 
fluid processes that can shift as the customer's needs shift will be used by 70% of digital uh, business models, 70% of successful digital business models. So if you do that, the likelihood is really good that you will be successful. Why is that so important? Because the customer journey in total changed. What I learned in school, I see some young guys here, maybe it's different, but I went to business school, what I learned at business school is that there's a certain model, and the certain model is always the same. It's attention, interest, desire, and action. And that model is from Elmo Louis, 1889. 18, not 19, 1889. And that is really, really old school. And you have to know that the conveyor belt was invented in 1870. So everybody thought everything is like a conveyor belt. Step A, B, C. A, B, C. Attention, interest, uh, desire, action. Ba, 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 ba. But new school is different. New schools is that the saying that there's constantly alternating operation systems. Chaos. Chaos is the new school. And chaos is ruling our world. Chaos is changing everything, and everything around you is melting and is changing the shape, and it doesn't exist like it used to exist. We have the melting of normal. Everything goes away. We used to go on vacation on a normal vacation. Where do you go on vacation? Yeah, like a normal person, I don't know, to the ocean, to the mountains. And then you might have had this crazy guy, like a diver. One of your uncles, one of my uncles was a diver. He wasn't a real diver, but he had a diving mask and a snorkel. And I, to me, it was Jacques Cousteau. And then I met him, Uncle Klaus, and I said, Uncle Klaus, can I take a photo with you, with a real diver? And I was proud, I knew a diver, how cool is that, you know? But today, everybody is a diver, everybody goes to Zen retreats, everybody goes into the desert or goes to learn how to cook stuff and stuff like that. And there's, it's not normal anymore, we have many, 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 many special normals, and we have really weird groups like hard rock lovers, people that love hard rock, and they are not normal. But in a certain group, they are so normal that Tui Cruises has a full metal cruise and everybody's on the ship like you, going, yay, hot rock forever, and loving it. And that is not normal. That's weird. But they think it's, if you're surrounded by those people, you think, yeah, everybody's like me. <laughs> it's totally normal. So the customer is not the mass anymore. The customer is a weird person who thinks he's a superhero or she's a superhero and dresses like a superhero at home and is a very individual, a very, lots of single individuals, lots of very special individuals, really, really weird people. So where's the ad? Where's the ad? How can you address those people? Of course, there's mass advertising behind me, but that is not the only ad. The real ad is there. The real ad is on my mobile phone. And if the ad is on the mobile phone and it's not with mass advertising, you have to re redesign the entire way you think about communication. Because you learned, or at least I learned in school, that the most important thing to have is a USP, a unique selling proposition. But it was unique to you, to your company. If you're the customer, it was the same unique selling proposition for every single customer, for every single individual, in every single context. You didn't change the USP. So in reality, it was a uniform selling proposition. It was the same for everybody. Everybody had to buy your product because of the same reason. And those times are gone. Today we have an ISP, an individual selling proposition. And you can actually address that. You can give a new reason for every single person, every single uh, context to buy your product. And you can do that and communicate it because of that thing because of the thing in my hand, because of the smartphone. Because we have a smartphone on us all the time. And that basically means that we are already cyborgs. There's no difference if the smartphone chip is two centimeters above your skin or under your skin. It's the same thing. So basically, cyber and non-cyber becomes one. Technology becomes a part of us. Technology is a part of everything. And if technology is a part of everything, and there's computers like Watson that are better in medical school than doctors, and stuff like that, and predictive analysis, and data can predict better than regular people can, and things like that are happening, this really changes our position in the business world and in, and in our life. Why does it change our position? Because we are group-oriented people. We are a pack of humans, like there's a pack of wolves. And how does a pack of wolves 
uh, organize itself, the pack of wolves looks at what the people in what, what the wolves in the pack can do, and the wolf that is relative fastest compared to the others is the wolf that will run, and the wolf that is relative most timid is the one that warns because it's ah something happened oh yeah I mean nothing, <laughs> and we organize our life like that. So basically, in our home. The person who's relative the most handy ones is the person who drills the hole, if we need a hole to be drilled. And in our home, in my family, my wife is handier than me, so she's the person who drills the hole. My wife is the person to have, she's not the absolute best, but she's the relative best. And what do I do? What do I do when she drills the hole? The hole. I bring her coffee. I put music on. I say how great she is. I do nice things. I do loving and belonging. And she does the shit. <laughs> so basically, if somebody else does the work for you, you can move up the Maslow pyramid. It's totally, totally good. It's important that if robots do stuff for you, that you move up the scale. We're in a very, very nice hotel, and I'm happy to stay here, and there's a robot that opens the door, right? Nobody opens the door, the door opens by itself. But still, there's a guy who says, welcome to our hotel. And that's just loving and belonging. So the thing is that the more machines there are, the more technical our life gets, the more important it is that you deliver emotions. You have to deliver loving and belonging as a brand. That is very important. That's the thing that a machine can't do. Not, at, not now. So humans get more liberated, interactions get more rare, in certain situations humans would vanish, right? It used to be that buying was always human to human. We bought music at a store, we bought travel tickets at this guy's place, how should he know where I want to go? We went shopping in Stone and Line, and this era is ending. That's a robot, that's a humanoid robot in Japan again. And technology chooses the products for us. Technology scans the web and says, yeah, boom, that's a nice shirt, selects the product, and actually soon buys the product, right? So that basically means that for you, if you have a store, your target group includes machines. Your target group is no longer just humans. And why do we find it okay? Why do we actually think it's okay that machines are part of the thing? Because it's easier for us. It's a lot easier for us. If somebody else does it, we don't have to do it. I'm super happy that my wife drills. I much prefer that I make the coffee and put music on. It's a much nicer thing. It's easier for us. Simplicity drives decision. The writing is on the wall again. Of course, this thing takes awesome pictures, but it's complicated. You have to have it on you. You have to read the manual. You can't just use it. You have to study it and all kinds of things. That's why most photos are taken like that. It's not the best thing, but if you look at Flickr, I think 75% uh, or more of the Flickr photos are done with a smartphone because it's easier. Of course, you can listen to music like that, but you have to learn how to actually operate it and set the sound and stuff like that. And it's easier to listen to music on that thing because it's easier. Of course, I can actually look at a map and figure out where I am in Sweden, but I don't. And you don't when you go to a new city because you have a navigation system and that tells you your hotel room is 200 meters on the right side. And that's all you need to know. It's a lot easier. We basically have one interface for everything. And if we understand that interface, we never ever have to learn anything new because we understand this interface. And the phone is us and we are our phone. And is it a phone? Not really. How much time would you say you spend on your phone every day? I think an easier question would be, when don't I have my phone? Four or five hours. Six hours? Solid, four to six hours. Twenty-three? <laughs> How much of that time is spent on actual phone calls? Uh, zero. <laughs> None. Zero. There's no, I don't, I don't think people really call each other anymore. I call people and people get weirded out that I called them. <laughs> That's it. I call people and people get weirded out that I call them. <laughs> totally right. I, we are not online, we live online. 79% of people are more, spend more time on the mobile phone than on the PC, obviously. That's my son and his friend. What do we do on our mobile phone? Everything. 
We do everything on the phone all the time. I totally love the sign there. We do everything on the phone all the time, and that's creating data all the time, right? So face-to-face -face communication is becoming face-to-interface, interface-to-interface, interface to interface, interface to robot, face-to-robot, robot-to-robot. The job killers are there. I don't know what job you have, but it's very likely that a program or a robot can do that. The job killers are there, and we're losing millions and millions and millions of jobs already. But that's not the first time that machines kill all our jobs. If you look at any country in the world, 100 or 150 years ago, basically 65% or whatever of the people used to be farmers. Everybody was a farmer. And then came the milking machine and the, and the tractors and things like that. And all of a sudden, you didn't have to have that many farmers anymore. And the farmers said, oh my God, what is Peter going to do? What is Mary going to do now that there's a milking machine? Yeah, they moved to the city and, I don't know, opened a club and now we our DJs. <laughs> you know, they do different things. So when some jobs die, new ones appear. And I think being a DJ is probably better than shoveling cow shit. But that's my only my so the environment is changing and you need to adapt. And agility wins, you have to do it fast. So whenever you have a new technology, you have to ask yourself, does this new technology increase speed and, 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 and agility? Does the new technology make you faster? And if it makes you faster, do it. Or does the new technology decrease speed and agility? And it's much more like a bureaucracy and it gets more complicated. Then don't do it, right? And digital, most of the times, makes you faster. And you heard this all day long and people on stage and you say, yeah, it's true. It's true for all, but not for me. And the reason is that we tend to exempt ourselves from examples. And that is not written by a business book, but by a psychiatrist, Kahneman. And Kahneman says, we tend to exempt ourselves from example because we love the status quo. We love the comfort zone. We actually like to hang around, right? We like to just stay, even if you're a superhero, oops, sorry, uh, uh, even if you're a superhero, you don't, you, you much rather like to uh, hang on the ch uh, in a chair, right? And then somebody says, hey, we need to change. Superhero, we need to change. And then what do you think? They don't mean me, they mean the others. And then we say, no, we mean you. And then you think, they mean the others. <laughs> and then we say, no. And then you think, hey, the waves will pass. I just chill. It's just a moment. Virtual reality will go away. 3D printing will go away. Contextual advertising will go away. Only small boats shake. But I'm a big boat. And what could possibly happen? Boom, that can happen. <laughs> But then you say, yeah, shit. <laughs> but I don't want to learn. We hate learning. I don't want to go to piano lessons. Oh, that's disgusting. <laughs> we hate to learn. And if you're forced to learn because your parents say you have to learn piano, then you can only accept it when you copy others. When your piano teacher does something and you do the same. So if we need to learn, we copy the existing because we have mirror neurons. And everybody has mirror neurons. <laughs> <laughs> and we love to copy things. And if you're a manager, you copy best practice. That's what they did in the US and in Spain. And Amazon did that, and Uber did this, and you copy it, right? Because managers follow the rules. But if you're a leader, you look for big new ideas. Because leaders break the rules, and leaders make new rules. Because leaders know change will happen either to you or because of you. Thank you very much. Fascinating. Fantastic speech. Wow. I would have liked to have a week to think about the questions I'd like to put. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, wow. Well, I, I consider myself being an internet visionary and I've been for the last 20 years. I'm getting really old. And, um, it's, I don't even know where to start. I, I actually need to have some help from somebody here, because where do you go from here? Because we, I think we, everybody feels that we're part of this. Everybody is afraid yeah. of, of change. Everybody tries not to. 
Uh, uh, let, me, let me answer that. Yes. Because let me answer that in, in, in three minutes and then we don't sure, need to Sure, 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 perfect. Love okay, it. everybody is afraid of change and everybody is afraid where stuff is going, right? Yeah. Why is that? Because you as a company, you want to have both feet on the ground. That's when you feel good. But then stuff is moving, progress is happening step by step by step. And you have to keep up with the progress step by step by step. And what does that mean? You have both feet off the ground, you're static, oh my god, I have to lift one foot. And you lift one foot and then you lift the other foot and you're not that stable anymore. Because even if you just want to keep up with speed, it's like that. But that's not everything, because if development is running, just walking is not fast enough. This development is running. You need to do this. Bam, 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 bam. Both feet off the ground. And both feet off the ground is really dangerous. If you go to your boss and you say, hey boss, we have both feet off the ground. The boss says, ooh, not good. Man, that's really, really dangerous, you know. We can be in a minefield, we can explode when we land. But if you go uh, to your boss like, in Silicon Valley and you say, hey, we have both feet off the ground, you know what he or she will say? Awesome, we are flying. We are flying, we have both feet off the ground, it's wonderful. And the fact is the same, it's an attitude. So the change will happen, and there will be moments of both feet off the ground. It will happen, it has to happen, it needs to happen. And the only thing is that you have to love that. So that's my advice to you. Thank you very much again.